of welcoming to Ward Camp Raleigh, Elisa Herb. Um, this is the best session <laughs> that's going to start at 2.05 today. Okay. And probably one of the better ones for the camp. Not as good as the one that happens at 4.30, though. <laughs> um, everybody, who, who has not seen Field of Dreams, the movie Field of Dreams? All right. If you've not seen it, there's a line that's in it that everybody knows. If you build it, they, they will come. come. <laughs> well, web design, product design, it's kind of the same thing. If you build it, they will come. But they won't necessarily always like it. <laughs> User experience is pretty important. Making sites, making apps, making plugins that work well for your users, it's important to get the most utility out of them. And Alisa will take us through a discussion of how to make the worst product. All right, thanks, Ray. It was a um, better introduction than I could have done myself, so thank you. It was the best one you got right at 205. It is, <laughs> yes. <laughs> so that is not my presentation. Um, that is. Okay. This is the ultimate guide to building the worst product. So hopefully everybody in this room um, has some kind of stake in making the internet a better place. Um, whether you're a developer, a designer, a writer, an SEO whiz, a user of the internet, anything, you have a stake in this. So um, there are five rules I'm gonna go over um, real quick that are the things that you have to remember if you want to build the worst product out there, worst website, um, worst app, anything. Rule number one, ignore the user. These people do not matter. Um, really, you're the one that has to spend hours and hours of your time making this thing work, and so you're the primary person that, um, that matters in the whole process of building the thing. Um, so those, the people who come later, just don't even worry about it. Uh, rule number two, work alone. It's really important. You do not meet other people who have similar jobs to you. Um, if you're on a team, just hold yourself away. Work from home. Do not answer the phone. That's also very important. Um, no Slack, no message boards. Um, just it's really it's, it's a hard thing when you have people um, interrupting your thought process. You know, you're in the flow and you just... Um, it's, it's disruptive. You're never going to get anything done if you um, have people bothering you all the time. Um, the third rule is to ship it final, fast and final. Um, you get paid more uh, per hour if you, if you do it really, really, really quick and it's just out the door. So um, really it's a, it's, a, it's a good thing to, um, to quote high and come in really low. And like the lower you come in, it's, it's way better. So um, you want to get it out the door as quickly as you can without having any kind of time for um, something to go wrong before you've, before you've said goodbye. The fourth rule is don't collect feedback from anybody. So as soon as somebody looks at it and they find something that's wrong with it, it just slam the door in their face. Um, you, you don't want to um, be influenced. After all, you are the primary person that matters in the whole process. So if somebody doesn't agree with you, then that's too bad for them. The fifth rule, never think about it again. After you <laughs> ship it, it's done. You, you spend that time on it, and uh, it doesn't matter anymore. Um, you can move on to the next project, and um, after all, you're not using it, so it doesn't matter because you are the most important person in the process. So um, these are obviously facetious rules. Um, my name is Elisa. Um, I'm the CEO and creative director of Unity Digital Agency. Um, we're here in North Carolina. Um, it's my, my passion really is um, 
making the world a better place and doing that through the internet. Um, I work, I guess, me and our, my team um, work on creating websites for uh, community-driven organizations, nonprofits, B corporations, um, people that really have a, a stake in their community, and we want to support them. So um, the users really are the most important people, uh, the people who are going to be using the, the websites that you're building. Um, your clients, all of these people are really important. So um, your, your role as a developer or as a designer really is in helping to elevate their message um, and get their message out there um, and helping them out. So that's really um, what I'm passionate about. I'm a developer. I've been a developer way longer than it looks. Um, for over 20 years, I've been hacking away at a computer. I taught myself HTML and CSS in the mid-90s. Um, and I never really expected that I would be here. Um, I don't have any degrees in anything related to um, coding. <laughs> um, I have a master's degree in library science, and that's the closest that I can get to <laughs> saying that I have a degree in anything related because it is so related. It's information organization. Um, I'm a total nerd for that, for data, um, for making really elegant systems. Um, I'm also a mom and a business owner and I just have a million hats and I'm always being pulled in a ton of different directions so um, I'm a little scattered. But um, what I want to talk to you guys today about is about user experience and why user experience is really important, specifically for developers, but for everybody um, that has a role in making the internet. So um, I have, I'm out of order. Uh, all right, so first of all, what is UX? Yes, yes, everybody knows that, great. Well, maybe not everybody. So. User experience. Um, UX is such a buzzword these days, and it's the kind of thing that I think some people just may roll their eyes at. Um, but it is very important for everybody to understand fundamentally what is meant by user experience. This is not just design. This is not just graphic design or information architecture. It's really about how people use what you are creating. Um, so this is everybody. This is not just people that can use a mouse. This is not just people who can read. This is everybody. And as the internet is changing, as technology is changing, user experience is changing too. Um, it's not just about a computer anymore. Um, with VR, I loved this image because I can only imagine what she's seeing right now. You know, she's just like, ugh. <laughs> um, and so the developer who created whatever game or whatever world she's in right now, like she, they created this experience for this person. Um, and that's what we're all doing when we're building the web. We're creating experiences for people. So. Why does it matter? Uh, why are we all here right now? Um, it's really because we, as content creators, as designers, as developers, we, we don't have the same perspective as everybody else. We're all really diverse. We all have different experiences. And that comes across in how we're using the internet. So, and how we're building it. Um, all of my experiences that I've had have led up to the way that I go about building a website um, and the way that I approach using websites. Um, I, I get really frustrated when I'm using a website and um, as a developer, I know the way that it should work and then it doesn't and then I have no way of like doing anything about it. It just it makes me furious. I, I bought this um, new phone like a year ago, maybe not even that long ago, and it's from Motorola. And so I was on the Lenovo website and I was trying to get this and it was like a deal that was only available that one day. 
And I remember, I think first I tried to, I think I was just like adding the thing to my cart. And this is like Lenovo.com, not to like call them out or anything. But uh, <laughs> so I, I think I was adding, I was buying two phones. Um, I added it to my cart. I went to check out and you know those you know what a website looks like when there's no CSS It's just a white page with lines of text across and That's what I saw after I checked out and I'm like, I don't even know if that worked so I have no idea if my order went through so I did it again. Well, it turns out I just bought four phones <laughs> <laughs> I had I tried to get in touch with their tech support, and then they couldn't find my order based on my order number. It was a total disaster. Um, I ended up walking out of there with two phones for half the price of what I was going to pay anyway, so it was, in the end, net good for me, <laughs> maybe not for them. But that, that was a big loss for that company, not a huge loss, I mean, it was just two phones, but it was kind of a big loss for the company. You know, if they if because they had this terrible user experience for me, they lost money on that transaction. Um, so UX matters for all of our sanity, um, for everybody who uses the internet. Um, it matters for the bottom line for businesses. Um, and it's, I will argue about it all day with people. So, um, <laughs> well, yeah, I'll just move on. So. New rules. So the first five rules that I started with today um, obviously were facetious. I don't believe in any of that. So um, I'm presenting a set of new rules um, that are kind of based on the old ones. So rule number one is get to know your end users. So because you're not the only person on the planet, and because everybody has different perspectives, it's important to know who are the people that we are trying to get to use this thing. If you're trying to get your message out there, you need to understand the variety of perspectives that people have. So a process that we like to do at the beginning of one of our projects is, um, we call it the ecosystem analysis. And we kind of get an idea of, from our client's perspective, what, what kind of, it's not really competition, um, but it's where do they fall in their own ecosystem. Um, from there, we can understand the types of experiences that their users and their customers are accustomed to, um, and how can we make the, our client's website better than all of those others. Um, but also fit within what's expected. So we also like to create personas of um, the users that our, that our customers, I guess of our customers' customers. <laughs> um, can somebody tell us what a persona is? Yeah, so I heard Yeah, so I heard archetype and um, just to get it on mic what you said um, Hopefully I can remember it's a it's a kind of character that you create that represents um, a group of users so it might be somebody who's 12 who has overbearing parents and um, How are they going to use this thing? that you're building or writing or designing or whatever. And so um, having this, this like person that you've created and they're just this character, this archetypal person of, they're not, it's not like one person you're picking out, it's like who, you, you can define everything from um, their, their age, gender, income level, um, personality, um, race, disability, I mean everything, and you can give them a name and a photo, and this is the person that you're referring to, this is your ideal user, you might have a few, but as you're making decisions, 
throughout the whole process, you can refer back to that one person instead of thinking about how would I approach this as a user. You can take yourself a little bit outside of your own head and think about how does this user approach this issue. And they're, they become a real person through defining them through these personas that you create. So this really helps in terms of, like I mentioned just a second ago, getting out of your own head. I think a lot of times as developers or uh, people who are, who are working um, in this industry, we get really hung up on um, how, we, how we ourselves approach problems. Um, so the second rule, communicate with your team. This, even if you are a freelancer and you don't have a team, um, you presumably know people in your industry or um, even if you are totally isolated, maybe you could get on like Stack Overflow or something. But um, so communication is really important. Um, one of the things that we do um, at our team and I'm pretty sure most places that have people in the group together um, would be to create opportunities for everybody to check in together early and often about a project. So the earlier on in a process that developers involved in um, coming up with the design of a website or really understanding how this thing is going to get used, the better you're able to come up with, um, like you, you understand why uh, there might be a barrier in a certain place for as a developer, like why do I have to do it that way? Um, that's a question that um, I've encountered a lot with developers coming in at the end of a process. After the whole website's been built, not built, designed, and decided on, and then it's handed off to these developers, and the developers are like, well, that's stupid. <laughs> Why would you do it that way? Um, it's just, it's so helpful to, to really get past that point of bringing everybody into the room together to figure it out from the beginning together. So developers have an opportunity to share with strategists and designers to say, you know, this is really not a very good way of approaching this problem. Here's what my experience, like from my experience, here's a better way. But if there's something where somebody in strategy or design has determined, well, really for our target audience, we need to do it this way, then the developer can understand early on, oh, okay, I get it. I wouldn't want to do it this way if it was me, but because it's this, we're building it for this other group, then I guess I've got a little bit extra time to figure out a, pro or a way to solve that problem, um, rather than it just being dumped on their desk and like, oh gosh, how long did you give me to figure this problem out? Because that's not enough time. Um, if you've got a month while people are designing it, then you can figure out maybe some research time in there to get um, the answer that you're looking for. So then as you're going through the project, to be able to check in, everything changes from the beginning of the project to the middle to the end. There's always something the client's going to come back and say that, oh gosh, <laughs> we actually needed this uh, yesterday, but um, we might need this other whole part of the website. And there's, there's the opportunity for um, a, to have these check-ins to be able to say, well, you know, there's this change that the client wants, but maybe there's this other way that we can approach that. Maybe there's another way that, um, like a developer could come in and be like, well, you know, it's not as big of an issue as they think. We can do that. Or actually that sounds like something that we could do, but actually it's gonna be like a hundred more hours. So that's not really possible um, at this time. So it's the kind of thing where for, um, project managers, for designers, for um, strategists to be able, and developers to be able to communicate. Um, it's just crucial. Uh, number three is to make time for internal testing. And this involves everything from browser testing, device testing, um, if, if it's something like um, speed testing, like if you're testing on devices that are connected over 
Wi-Fi versus like 3G or something. You know, it, it's just important to know in the way that people are going to be using whatever you're building, does having them connect to it differently um, interfere with, with the process? So um, accessibility testing, I didn't even say that, but it's so important. And um, I'm just thrilled that there's been talks today already about accessibility. It's something I'm really passionate about. So um, the internal testing, you're, you're able to, um, as, as, as the developer, if you're working on the product yourself and you're building it, um, I, I always develop in Chrome um, and I have the hardest time making myself open up those other browsers, but <laughs> you have to. So um, emulation doesn't cut it <laughs> all the time. Um, I use browser stack. It's like uh, a pretty good emulator actually. Uh, but being able to test across all those browsers, different screen sizes, all of that. Also, it's really, really nice when you have somebody on your team that you can say, hey, can you look at this too? So if you don't really know other team members, then um, that can hurt this process too. So if you have other people on your team that you can say, like to the designer who designed the website, maybe if they get a chance to look at it, so really scheduling that time, I know that it's, it's always really, it's a hard balance um, with that, what I was saying earlier, coming in under budget. Um, but it's so important to schedule time for testing. Um, this, and, and making sure multiple eyes are on it, not just your own. So we always like to have this, import, this internal testing before we send it out. Then rule number four is recruiting test users and gathering feedback. So a lot of times your clients might be able to be your test user, but not all the time. Um, your clients, clients or customers might be completely different from them. They might be as different from them as you are from your client. So um, we've been running into a problem recently um, with one of our clients where we didn't, we didn't do this. <laughs> we should have. <laughs> uh, the gathering feedback needs to be a very organized process. You want to communicate to the people who are testing it exactly what you want them to tell you. Uh, because otherwise, they won't. Um, they will just say, like, I tested it. <laughs> OK. <laughs> and? <laughs> Did it work? Uh, what were you using? Um, you know, so we have one where these these kids are uploading photos through the website, um, and the website's not rotating. Like if you upload a photo from your iPhone, and it's like a vertical photo, and you take it, it's uploading sideways. Okay, um, so. We've determined that's obviously an issue. So um, now we've got these, these users who are testing it. And I think my suspicion is that they know that this is a problem, that the photos are sideways when they're uploading them. They're going into their computer, rotating photos, saving them, uploading them, saying, this picture didn't rotate the way it's supposed to. Well, we haven't communicated that the, that's expected behavior. Um, if you rotate a photo and save it, the, the orientation has been saved inside that image's metadata. It knows that it's supposed to be whatever you saved it as. If you take a picture and it's vertical, there's no, I wish I could test it. Um, <laughs> there's, there's, no, um, there's no way for, you haven't edited it. It's just a raw image um, with that metadata of it's supposed to be sideways, but it's actually, uh, it's wonky. But then, so anyway, I'm rambling. Uh, <laughs> so we needed to communicate to our users, to these testers, okay, here's how we want you to test it. Uh, everything else, the way that you do it is great because 
Um, we want to know that like under different situations in different browsers, all of these things. But it's important to have those parameters and it's important for, for how they're testing, but it's also important for them to have parameters for how they're sending you feedback. Um, so sometimes it can be hard um, if you have a small community or your clients um, have a small community for getting those test users. There are resources out there. Can't think of them off the top of my head. But there are resources um, online for you to say, test this, and then I think you just pay a little bit, and then you get people to test it and give you feedback. Um, it's helpful. So the fifth rule, follow up after launch. <laughs> when you're done with it, it's not over. Uh, I really hate to break it to you. But um, even with all the testing in the world, it's not going to be perfect, and you're going to have to touch it again. So. Um, if you finish a website and you hand deliver it to your client, you say it's done, they think it's done. Um, you're presenting the expectation to them that it's fine. Well, so a few months go by um, and they notice something's a little we bit weird with it, but they think, well, they're done with it. I mean, they. They said it was done, so I guess this is just how it is. It's just kind of weird, but I'll live with it. So they're not super happy. Um, if you come back out of the blue and are like, hey, how are things going? Like, everything good? Um, anything I can help you with? Like, that, that'll make them feel good to know that um, you've been thinking about it. Uh, knowing if you can keep up with things like, hey, Gutenberg's happening. Um, your clients are going to be really happy that you've come back and said, there's this thing happening. It's coming soon. Um, we care about you. We care about your website. We want to make sure that it doesn't just break. So here's what we want to do for you. Um, really that, that process of um, valuing your customers and um, really valuing that their website after a year um, maybe isn't working as, as, as well as it was when it was first launched. That's so normal. Um, and so really following up with them and knowing and communicating to them as you're, as you're launching and as, things, as time goes by um, that there are ways that you can still help um, and that Errors are expected. It's, it's just the way things are. Um, as servers get updated, as um, plugins get updated, and your, maybe your user, maybe your customer like clicks the update button, but they do it in a way that like maybe they didn't update WordPress first, and they updated the plugins, and then everything breaks, or whatever. Um, it's, just, it's just how it is. <laughs> We're all here um, to help. So. Um, I really love questions um, because I don't like to feel like I'm speaking to an empty room. So anyway, I uh, really appreciate you guys coming today, but um, are there any questions about user experience, development, anything like that? Um, when you give the website out for testing, mm -hmm. do you normally have things like uh, task-oriented, steps um, or recordings or something? So it's a process that we're definitely working on. Um, I think it's what, what has been helpful for us in the past is to have um, a spreadsheet where there's columns that allow them to, they know that they're, they have to look for a specific thing when they're testing to be able to see that like, oh, okay, this is where I put this issue. Um, so having something like that, like a Google Sheet, um, can be helpful. Yeah. I was going to piggyback on his. Um, okay. There was just Brandon just posted a blog post um, about putting that reduce in the plugin. I wanted to kind of get that Google uh, web sheet and just sort of see what they do. Did you say Delicious Brains is doing that? Mm -hmm. Nice. Cool. In your website proposals, do you include as a line item testing and that sort yes. of thing? Yes. We do. Um, it's something that 
yeah, we, we include it. We don't actually, no, we don't put it as a line item in our proposals. We don't want to make people think it's optional. Um, but it is in the scope of work. <laughs> and so we'll have it just as a non-negotiable. There's going to be testing. So we always include that. And yeah. also, can you offer, like, I know you said, you know, following up and something may be acting strange, you know, 30 days or something. Can yeah. you do, like, a, you know, like, a 30 day warranty after releasing it to say? Yeah. Um, and I should have mentioned this too. So we, we do have a warranty. Um, we also include as a non-negotiable a 30-day um, post-launch check-in, where it's sort of the post-mortem, although I hate that word, um, where, you, where we as a team internally debrief about a project. And then um, 30 days after launch, we have that client debriefing where it's like, okay, well, here's how do we do? Like, let's go over the process. Where where do we kind of fall down? What what went really well? Um, are there any kind of experiences that you're having with it after training? We always include training as well. And so, if you know, 30 days in, they still can't figure out. Well, how do I like delete a category or something? You know, we just didn't go over it. Then we can we can talk about it then. So it is it's really helpful um, to have that 30 days time period, I think. There's a touch of base on your, um, your client testing. Yeah. Basically, I call this the mom check. Um, this is because my mother is the most computer literate person that I know. And um, if she can use my website, anybody can. Yeah. So that is my tester. And um, I encourage anybody that's in a startup or something to find somebody that cannot use a computer that they can use their product to employ them. Yes. <laughs> How much does she charge? <laughs> yeah, yeah, the mom check. I like that. I haven't. You never heard that. Yeah. Yeah, I just, I, I remember when my mom was saying something about, I don't know, it was, it was something like her email wasn't working. And it was, yeah, yeah, it's, it's funny. Yeah. Any other? Oh, yes. What's the oldest version of IE you support? 11. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I'm with Lenovo. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. Oh, okay. <laughs> How many phones did you get? <laughs> oh, I got two. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I have one. It's mine and my husband's. Oh, okay. <laughs> that was going to be amazing. <laughs> I'm a little disappointed you're not. <laughs> yes? Do you have any recommendations for, uh, you were talking about speed testing the sites? Yeah. Um, is there any recommendations for like simulator software that we're using? Because, I mean, a lot of us are on 4G LTE and we jump to mobile. Yeah. We jump to wireless and we can't really simulate that. Um, I guess it's called GSM for being overseas. Yeah, so Chrome Developer Tools has throttling, and you can change. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Oh, yes. What was your very first computer? <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, well, so in, well, I don't know what happened there, but um, by, my dad, um, when I was a kid in the 80s, we had an Apple II. Um, but my own computer, when my dad like gave me my own computer, um, it was like Windows 98 kind of thing. Um, I built my own computer in college um, for fun. It had lights in it. I cut out the side of the, of the box and like put LEDs in there. It was cool. <laughs> it was actually really nerdy, but it was cool. <laughs> yes. I'll keep it from bringing it. Okay. <laughs> so, like, everybody has been going to this hamburger menu. Mm -hmm. I cannot stand it. What is your take on the hamburger menu? In what context? I don't like the icon. Okay. So, um, on, I, I'm, we use it on mobile. Um, it, it bothers me when it's on desktop. Uh, I don't want to hide things from users. Um, but on, on mobile, I mean, 
I've kind of gotten used to it as being like, it's, it's gotten to be more universally understood, maybe, as like a menu icon. Um, but I can't think of anything better. I'm also not that kind of designer that would be able to like invent something off the top of my head that would be better. Yeah. I saw a hand over, yeah. yeah. So like when you mentioned you at testing as a non-negotiable in scope of work, I'm noticing you know, finally people are coming back after two or three website integrations or you know, build outs and they, they think they kind of get it. Do you ever get any big question marks like what the heck is this in your scope? Why, why is this the first time I'm hearing of this? Why didn't you know past the agency has come to me about this? Uh, yeah, and it usually has to do with accessibility. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people don't understand why that's important, um, but it's a good moment for educating them about it. So, yeah. Could you give us a few words on why you feel that's important? Accessibility? Yeah, so 20% of the population um, has a disability. And so even, and, and a lot of them aren't visible disabilities, so you never know. Um, and that's a big percent of people to make feel alienated. Um, it is the most diverse minority group. Um, and so it's as, it's really, it's about sensitivity. Um, best practices in accessibility overlap with best practices in SEO. Um, it's like killing two birds with one stone when you do things the proper way um, in terms of the markup. Um, and it's, it's really about making the internet open to everyone. Um, is being in WordPress, you know, we're all really, I'm very passionate about open source. I don't think that you can have open source without including accessibility inside that where it's about openness. Dealing with the university system like California or Wisconsin or something like that, they're going to go through your VPAT level certification. So, if you have even a simple small company doing online testing of some kind and you're dealing with an online universe or a university system, next budget round, they're going to say, nope, they want to pass the uh, web accessibility. Yeah, yeah, it, it's a legal thing too. Um, but I don't want that to be like the thing that every. It's just it's you have to because of legal reasons. You have to because of ethical reasons. Yes. You mentioned accessibility testing when you're talking about the testing um, with functionality and browser. Uh, what are some of your favorite tools for accessibility testing? Well, there are a lot. Um, I have probably six different like bookmarklets in Chrome that let you test different things. There's. Um, I don't. I haven't found one tool that I like for every to hit like every test. Um, if you came to the accessibility talk earlier today, um, AX was mentioned. A X E. It's it's really good. Um, I use that. I use Wave. Um, I really like the tote. It's it's totally T O T A one one Y um, bookmarklet that gives you. Um, it actually is like a visual representation of like what a screen reader um, would say. It's like the screen reader wand. Um, it's not perfect, but it's good for like the first pass. Um, but then using the, um, I have a Mac, um, and so I use uh, Chrome Vox as a voiceover testing, um, not voiceover, what's it called? Screen, screen reader, thank you. Screen reader testing. Um, then I also use um, voiceover. <laughs> That's why that word was in my head. Uh, voiceover on Mac um, to do testing. Um, and then we have a Windows computer in the office that I have not yet set up um, in, v, in V Access on, but I will. Um, and so doing all of those, it takes a long time, but that's why we build it into the scope of work. Um, back there first. Are there any like UX um, design blogs or resources you can share with us that you basically recommend? Uh, yes. I <laughs> Lexi can answer that maybe. Oh, it was medium.com? Yeah. 
Um, I think Blue Shirt, you had a question too. Do you, yeah, I got a lot of questions. <laughs> Do you present a new contract to address anything that broke is not really the client's fault? Say, for instance, um, we're doing a security update in WordPress, we shoot it to the site, it breaks, we go over there and they say, hey guys, it's not working right. So, I mean, as a developer, do you offer a new contract to fix that or you just handle that because you feel it's your responsibility? So, it falls within our 30-day warranty. I'm, I'm looking at like, But yes, yeah. so in our contract, um, it, it, there's a section about WordPress is open source software. We are not responsible for any of, you know, after 30 days. It's not our, it's not our responsibility. Um, so it would be a separate contract if somebody came back and said, hey, this isn't working anymore. It's like, well, things change, so. <laughs> and, it, and we didn't touch it, so it wasn't our fault that it broke. Um, it was working when we last touched it. So, yeah. So, kind of follow up on that. Like, when you're doing your teaching phase or your instructions on how to use things, do you ever go over, like, here's a list of good plugins to use under these situations that we can say aren't going to break your site because we've used them on any number of projects? Mm -hmm. Here are the ones that you want to avoid for these reasons. No, but I really like that idea. So, um, there's, whenever we build a website, we, we do it from beginning to end. We put all of the content in. Um, we're building custom themes and including all of the plugins that we use on all, not, depending on the functionality needs, but um, I like the idea of including a list of like, don't install this. Um, yeah. <laughs> I saw a hand over here and then there's one back there too. I don't know, yes. We do it screen share, and um, I've gotten pressure to standardize it and um, <laughs> make sure that it's like a video or something that's replicable, because a lot of times it's like, this is how you copy and paste. This is where you click publish. Like, it's, it's pretty standard stuff, but then there's always that like, for this content type that we built out, here's how you do it, and here's how you add all the custom things into it. It's, I think that we need to be doing a mix so of. But when you do the screen share, do you, do you record that and then let them have that later? Or can you just no, but I should. Um, yeah, I should, I should be recording those and saving them and sharing it. Um, yes. <laughs> I'm always striving to improve. <laughs> there was a question over here. Oh, yes. We have some clients who um, have very set, like all of the pages, it'll be like there's seven templates or something, and like all of their content will fit into one of these. Um, we'll build that out with ACF, Advanced Custom Fields Pro, usually. Uh, then if, if it's kind of like, if there aren't custom post types, it's all pages, but they kind of want to have flexible layout, then we'll go to the page builders. Um, I like to, I'm trying to stay away from the page builders a little bit, just um, it's harder as, I think it's, I think it's my bias as a developer though, where I don't like the way that they're built, so I don't want to use it. Um, but, but again, I'm not the, I'm not the end user, so what, what does it matter what I like? What was that plugin? Again? Advanced custom fields. Oh, the Troy Dean plugin? Video user manuals. There you go. Thank you. Thank you. Cool. Is that a paid plugin? Yes. Subscription. 
Okay. There was, yes. Yeah, so outside of the page builders, are there any popular plugins that you would, uh, that you would um, suggest we not pursue? Ooh. Um, <laughs> I don't know if I'm allowed to on camera. <laughs> oh, I got oh. an answer for that. Alicia will be at the happiness bar. Yes. <laughs> <Someone> <laughs> <after a presentation. laughs> It's if there's no if there's any plugins that I would recommend steer, steering clear of. So, yes. This is me going into a little bit out of US, but since you do develop websites for clients, how do you get your copy text to remote clients? Uh, how do I get my copy text from remote, from remote clients? Yeah, because you already put your design, you've already presented them what they want, they approved yeah. it. How do you get the word that they want to go on that page? First. You go first. Yes. Yes, yes, um, or at least in conjunction with. I, I don't like to go into development, into the build without that. Um, my own personal process is putting the content in and then building it um, so that it's, I mean, there's always gonna be something, they'll agree in the design to it being this like, oh yeah, this is a short section, we don't need a whole lot there, and then they'll give you two pages, so <laughs> it's, it's, it's easier to design, and it's less like hair pulling when you've got their content first. And I don't like keep going, but <laughs> how, how do you, how do you, uh, do you just give them the topic of the, of the page you're gonna be building, and then allow them to write the blurbs, or what do you do? Yeah, so we'll have, we, we create like a site map and say like, these are the pages, and we do that in, in conjunction with them based on, um, you know, their industry, what they might already have a website and like what works on their current website what are we keeping what are we getting rid of and what's new um but then after that then it's yeah it's homework or they can pay us right, yeah. yeah there's a hand back there somewhere no okay yes so you had mentioned that you do uh content entry as part of the project um and i'm, I'm sure that accessibility is part of that so you're thinking about accessibility through the project um, but then you hand the project off to a client, and I was curious about what are some of the effective ways in uh, preparing a client in regards to accessibility after the fact? Yeah, so I teach the clients about heading levels and alt tags, and that's kind of all I go over. But okay. were you, there, there was you were at the accessibility talk earlier, yeah. right? So there's this new plugin that NC State has developed that looks amazing, yeah. that <laughs> lets you test or lets your clients test the accessibility of their content. Since you don't have your control over that one big block of content after you hand off the website, this, this thing looks amazing. So I'm gonna be putting that on all of our websites. <laughs> yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that. It's really yeah. cool. Yeah, it's really cool. What's that called? Um, I don't remember. Accessibility Helper. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. NC State Accessibility Helper. It's on GitHub. Um, it, it works with the GitHub updater plugin where any plugins that are hosted on GitHub rather than the WordPress um, plugin repository, um, it can automatically be updated through that. Any other questions? Well, I really appreciate you all coming today. Um, thank you for sitting through this and um, I'll be at the happiness button.